Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Before I deliver opening remarks, I want to note that today the committee is meeting virtually. I want to announce a couple of reminders to members about the conduct of the hearing. First, members should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. And finally, if members have documents they wish to submit to the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the meeting. Good morning and thank you to the witnesses joining us, joining us today, this committee held its first hearing on the role of science and technology in combating human trafficking a year and a half ago. It coincided with the World Day Against Trafficking in Persons. As we are in the wake of the National Human Trafficking Prevention Month, now is a good time to discuss the data challenges that stymie advances in anti-trafficking research and technology development. Human trafficking is a major issue in Texas. And just days ago, a raid in Dallas resulted in the arrest of two traffickers. This crime preys on the most vulnerable and it knows no borders. It is not gender specific and it crosses socioeconomic barriers. In the 20 years of policy making on this issue, what progress has been made? What's working? What isn't and why? Unfortunately, some of the data needed to address these questions is too often siloed across various databases is non-existent or is inconsistent. The amount of peer-reviewed academic literature and robust advanced research on human trafficking is disappointingly low. Standardizing, standardizing data and improving uh, data collection can provide a basis for more and better research, analysis, and ultimately improved outcomes for the survivors. Bringing together multidisciplinary teams of researchers with survivors, nonprofits, federal, state, and local, and tribal governments, private sector, and international partners will be critically important. We need more federal coordination of research and technology development that would lead to evidence based, victim centered, survivor informed, and culturally informed anti-trafficking strategies. Increasing data sharing and making use of, of machine learning and other tools will help bring the crimes out of the shadows. As we continue to tackle this issue, we must also move toward more equitable data collection. To understand the full scale and scope of this issue, we must ensure that black, brown, indigenous, LB, LGBTQ, and non-citizen survivors of human trafficking are included in the data. I hope that this committee will support a strong role for federally supported science and technology and a whole of government effort to combat human trafficking for a safer and more secure America. The chair now recognizes Mr. Lucas for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson, for holding today's hearing to explore the role of science and technology in disrupting human trafficking. And thank you to your expert to our expert witnesses for your participation. I look forward to your testimony to learn more about how we can use research to improve anti-trafficking practices. And thank you, Mr. Darston, for testifying before us again today on this very important topic.
I look forward to building off what we learned from you during a hearing we held two years ago on the same topic. We're glad to have you back and with us here today. Human trafficking is a crime that is often described as hidden in plain sight, as it can be difficult to detect the warning signs and many victims are afraid to come forward. Often human trafficking criminals operate in public places such as airports and hotels, as well as public forums online. While these victims cannot be shackled, they may not be shackled, I should say, human trafficking is a form of modern day slavery. Human trafficking is a global problem and it affects every state, making it difficult to address, and each state faces its own challenges. In my home state of Oklahoma, the increase in crime has become particularly problematic, including among Oklahoma's indigenous populations. In recent years, Oklahoma's indigenous populations have been affected by concerningly high rates of human trafficking, murder, and abduction. We also face challenges from illegal cannabis growing operations, which have been linked to suspected human trafficking networks. I'm hoping some of the research we address today can touch on how to handle these challenges. In 2014, the International Labor Organization estimated that human trafficking was a $150 billion industry worldwide. Eight years later, this outdated estimation is still being widely cited to describe the current state of human trafficking impacts around the globe. This is in part due to a lack of new data and coordinated data sharing. But without updated and accurate data, data, it is difficult to understand the full extent of the problem. One of the reasons I enjoy serving on the Science Committee is our ability to come together and focus on solutions to some of the world's biggest challenges. And combating human trafficking is just that. It is an issue that cuts across multiple jurisdictions and federal agencies. And research and scientific analysis have an important role to play. As members of the Science Committee, we can help target investments to address research gaps and advance technologies to help law enforcement industry. And NGO research can ensure that we are most efficiently and effectively utilizing data and collaborating with stakeholders. Strategic investments in new and emerging technology tools, such as artificial intelligence, transform how we approach this problem. AI can perform large-scale data analysis to detect suspicious financial trends and utilize facial recognition technologies to match victim identities with missing person notices. Continued investments into AI basic research innovations is just one example of how technology can be deployed to fight this deplorable crime. It is vital that we do not turn a blind eye to human trafficking in our own communities and around the globe. We develop we must work together to support research and technology development to end human trafficking for good. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Uh, thank you. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Greta Goodwin. Dr. Goodwin is director of the Homeland Security and Justice Team at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. In this role, she leads GAO's work on justice and law enforcement issues. She has directed reviews on virtual currencies used to facilitate human and drug trafficking, law enforcement efforts to combat online sex trafficking, the crisis of missing or murdered indigenous women and human trafficking among others. Our next witness is Dr. Louise Shelley. Dr. Shelley is the Omer L. and Nancy Hurst Professor of Public Policy and the Director of Terrorism, Trans Transnational Crime and Corruption Center at the George Mason University. She is a leading expert on the relationship among terrorism, organized crime and corruption, as well as human trafficking, transnational crime and terrorism. She also specializes in illicit financial flows and money laundering. Dr. Shelley was an inaugural an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and is the author of several books. 
Our third witness, <clears throat> Ms. Teresa Harris. Ms. Harris is an interim program director of scientific responsibility, human rights and law program at the American Association of Advancement of Science. In this role, she manages the program's projects on science and human rights, including on-call scientists, a volunteer referral service that provides technical support for human rights organizations, as well as activities that promote greater understanding of the human right to science and a new project on artificial intelligence and human rights. Our final witness, Ms. Hannah Dorton. Ms. Dorton is the Assistant Director of Ethics, Human Rights and Technology at the Business for Social Responsibility. Her work focuses on the intersection of human rights and new disruptive technology and leads the tech against trafficking collaborative initiative. Prior to joining BSR, she worked with the Skoll Foundation and also spent six years working in anti-human trafficking in West Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Bay Area. As our witnesses should know, you each will have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Now let's start with Dr. Goodwin. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee. I am pleased to be here today to discuss the usefulness of data, as well as the challenges policymakers and law enforcement encounter when protecting vulnerable populations or in combating illicit activities when data are not readily available. We have reported on issues affecting a variety of vulnerable populations, the need for additional data, and the opportunities to help ensure that relevant data are accessible and of sufficient quality. For example, we noted that human trafficking is occurring in the US and that trafficking may be facilitated by the use of virtual currencies. We've also noted that the incidents of violence committed against American Indian and Alaska Native women in the US constitutes a crisis and that various federal officials and tribal stakeholders have raised concerns about the lack of cross-jurisdictional cooperation and comprehensive national data when it comes to the federal response to this crisis. My statement today discusses our prior work examining the extent to which the number of missing or murdered indigenous women in the US is known and the use of virtual currencies for human and drug trafficking and the extent to which agencies collect data on these topics. Last October, we reported that data on the total number of missing or murdered indigenous women is unknown because federal databases do not contain comprehensive national data. Due to differences in the characteristics of these databases, included their intended purposes, specific contents, organization, and applicable statutory requirements, they cannot be combined together for the purpose of providing comprehensive information. We reported that the Department of Justice has taken some steps to analyze data in the federal databases, including publishing more detailed single year statistics on missing persons by race, age, and gender. This type of information could help DOJ and other stakeholders better understand the nature of the crisis. There is no reliable estimate on the number of trafficking victims in the US or about the money generated by this crime. The quality and quantity of the data are often hampered by the hidden nature of the crime, challenges to identifying individual victims, gaps in data accuracy and completeness, and significant barriers regarding the sharing of information. Adding the use of virtual currencies into this mix, which can be used to purposely conceal illicit transactions, makes it tougher to develop reliable estimates. A 2020 report by Polaris a nonprofit organization knowledgeable about human trafficking found that virtual currencies were the second most commonly accepted method of payment on 40 platforms in the online commercial sex marketplace, 
which has been used to facilitate sex trafficking. Also, the number of times virtual currency and human trafficking appeared in suspicious activity reports filed with Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network nearly doubled between 2017 and 2020. We've reported that data from selected federal agencies on virtual currencies use for human and drug tra trafficking may not be consistently captured. So agencies may not have complete data when assessing or reporting on the illicit use of this currency. We've made recommendations designed to address data challenges and agencies have taken some steps and we will continue to monitor their efforts. An effective framework or structure for capturing and reporting data can help ensure that an agency is providing useful and transparent information to the public. Such data and statistics from the federal government and researchers provide the foundation for policymakers to make informed decisions. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, this concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so very much. Our next witness is Dr. Louise Shelley. Thank you for this invitation, Chairwoman Johnson, Co-Chair Lucas, and the members of the committee. Last month, Attorney General Garland released a strategy to address human trafficking. And it, it said reliable prevalence estimates have been difficult to ascertain. Greater support and funding for research and data collection are needed. But the problem is not just one of understanding the prevalence of the problem. It is much broader in understanding what is the role of who, what is the nature, the scope, the diversity and the finances of human trafficking or the role of facilitators from the legitimate economy. And even though we have spent and invested large amounts of money, money will not get you to a strategy that is effective unless we have a better understanding of the complex and diverse aspects of the phenomenon. So I'm asking not only for improved data collection, but the need for much more basic research to understand this phenomenon. There has been much more money invested in understanding the problems of the drug trade and drug trafficking and the persons who are affected by the sale of drugs. And some of those insights into that latent and criminal phenomenon could also be applied to the field of human trafficking. As has been mentioned previously, there are limited available data sources in the United States, and all of them have existing limitations as I present in my written testimony. But important opportunities exist for increasing or improving federal data collection and data sharing among federal agencies and between the public and private sector is key. Um, as I will discuss later in a pres another project I have funded by the NSF, we are having valuable data sharing with the private sector that is giving us enormous insights. But part of what we need to do to fund this, to have successful fundamental research is to anonymize data that we have and information such as on T visas that would help us do the AI analytics that were mentioned earlier to address this problem of human trafficking. There are many tools that were available if we began to focus on the basic research. I was asked to discuss a research project I have now that has been funded by the National Science Foundation on disrupting illicit supply chains. And as was mentioned in the introduction, hotels are a key element of human trafficking. Um, this has been found in research done in Texas. It has been found in the survey of federal trafficking cases. And to do this, we began to do an inventory of these using federal criminal cases. And then we focused on analyzing this data in terms of its, social, social, um, its demographic distribution. The insights from this research are not only basic research, but can inform strategy and inform allocation of law enforcement resources and also help us understand how we must mobilize the private sector 
to address this phenomenon. But we also need to be using data, not only from hotels, but tech companies, rideshare companies, and others that are deeply involved in facilitating human trafficking. The insights of this research that we've done for NSF are not just scholarly articles, we have been targeting them to reach different communities concerned with the hospitality sector, concerned with constructing algorithms for the financial services sector. And we've been told that this research is useful in finding out how to target this phenomenon. So what we need to think about is how we can better structure this research to work with an organization like NSF that is responsible for basic research, who is responsible for developing cutting edge AI tools and help coordinate with existing mission agencies. Together with a larger effort, we could be achieving results that would advance our gaps in data and provide the insights that we need to address this phenomenon. But we also need to be focusing not just on the illicit side of this, but the facilitating role of the legitimate actors. And we need to, as was mentioned, develop data and tools. The need to combat human trafficking is an issue that unites much of American society, civil society, different diverse communities. And we need more basic research, more willingness to share data, and the development of application of more sophisticated data analytics to address this problem that has grown enormously in the virtual world, as was previously mentioned, in the last decade, and unfortunately has grown significantly during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Teresa Harris. Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Teresa Harris, and I'm the Interim Director of the Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights, and Law Program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS. AAAS is the world's largest multidisciplinary scientific society and publisher of the science family of journals. Our mission is to advance science, engineering, and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all people, to advance science and serve society. At AAAS, I direct our science and human rights projects. One of those is On Call Scientists, a volunteer program through which AAAS connects volunteer scientists, engineers, and health professionals with projects where their research can have a positive impact on human rights. I help human rights organizations reframe their information and technology needs as scientific research questions. Then I identify volunteers from the scientific community who have that information or experience. In many instances, these are pretty straightforward research questions that boil down to sharing scientific information and knowledge and applying them to a specific human rights situation. However, the information gaps related to human trafficking are much more complicated than many of the other questions we receive. For example, for estimating prevalence, there is no one algorithm or sampling method that can solve all of the missing data problems. In every labor sector where human trafficking happens, there are different recruiting practices, different types of laborers who are sought after, different payment methods, and different types of supply chains, just to name some of the distinctions. Then in each location, there are cultural differences regarding work expectations. All of this means scientific researchers studying human trafficking need data from public agencies and private companies, from sampled surveys and ethnographic research, and from health, social services, business licensing, transportation records, education, law enforcement, and so much more. And this is just to assess the prevalence of human trafficking. Understanding vulnerability, criminal network operations, and what kinds of support are most effective for survivors involves similarly complicated but different data sources and technological tools to collect, analyze, and interpret the data. 
These are not the kinds of questions volunteer scientists in our program can take on by themselves in their spare time. These are research questions that require cooperation across teams of quantitative and qualitative researchers in the mathematical, behavioral, and social sciences. Companies that are collecting data about their supply chains to prevent human trafficking, human rights experts who work with survivors, government officials at the local, state, tribal, and national levels, and organizations like the International Labor Organization. The involvement of federal science agencies to support research and development to address human trafficking is critical. There is much more detail in my written testimony, but with my remaining time, I want to emphasize three points. First, advocates against human trafficking are in need of this scientific research to inform their efforts, but too often that information is unavailable. Addressing the research gaps will require coordination across sectors, data sources, and scientific disciplines. Second, technology development for data tools that can be used by both scientists and human rights professionals in the field is a much needed area of emphasis. This development must involve coordination across scientific disciplines and across sectors, government, academia, not-for-profits, and industry. Third, data collection and sharing need to be done in ways that respect and do not violate human rights. That should always be the case in scientific research, of course, but there's a heightened scientific responsibility because of the vulnerabilities inherent in any data that is collected or shared regarding human trafficking. Scientists' ethical and human rights responsibilities must be central to every decision made about what data are collected, how the data are stored, and the circumstances under which they are shared. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Our final witness is Ms. Hannah Dornton. Good morning, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to participate in today's discussion. My name is Hannah Darnton, and I'm here today representing the industry collaboration Tech Against Trafficking. Tech Against Trafficking is a coalition of technology companies, including Amazon, BT, Microsoft, Salesforce, and others, that are collaborating with global experts to help eradicate human trafficking using technology. A large part of our work is focused on bringing the anti-trafficking field together, supporting the creation of tools and systems that will allow for increased sharing, collaboration, and impact across the sector. Through the Tech Against Trafficking Accelerator Program, we work with organizations hoping to utilize and deploy technology to advance and scale their work. We then leverage the insights and learnings gleaned from these partnerships to think strategically about how to capitalize on the use of data and technologies and create open source assets and tools that will advance the field as a whole. A large part of our focus has been on enabling data and connection, aggregation, and the generation of useful insights and analysis for stakeholders in ways that do not compromise the safety and security of the individuals whose information is contained within the data. However, through our engagements, we've noted that data is often discussed in isolation without consideration of the underlying technology infrastructure or the broader anti-trafficking ecosystem of service providers and victims. To ground our discussion today, there are five things we recommend keeping front of mind as the field pursues new advancements and exploration in human trafficking data. First, we need to consider what will data help achieve? The anti-trafficking field frequently cites a need for more data without specifying the questions that need to be answered to build strategic programs capable of delivering system-wide impact. As a field, we need to ask, what key questions will data help answer? What will the data be used for? And what will en enable practitioners to achieve? We have a largely extractive approach to data collection and use. Researchers, policymakers, technologists developing new tools or solutions often ask nonprofits, direct service providers to provide sensitive information and data about their beneficiaries without an explanation of how it will be used, aggregated, stored, shared, or how it will benefit them. There's a need to reframe our approach to data to ensure that organizations and individuals providing the data understand and consent to how it will be used that the appropriate privacy and protection measures are in place to protect sensitive information, and importantly, that we consider how the collection and use of their data will help advance their work. Second, how can we ensure fit for purpose tools? Research, data, technology, all needs to be translated or adapted for the specific context in which it will be used. Large data sets 
off-the-shelf tools and broad research questions are often unable to answer specific questions or meet the needs of policymakers, law enforcement, or service providers operating on the ground. Researchers, data scientists, and technologists will need to work closely with these groups to ensure that they are appropriately integrating the considerations and needs of stakeholders who will be translating their work into real world applications. Third, we need to support a well-funded, well-resourced collaborative data ecosystem. This means funding. The process, systems, and infrastructure for data collection, aggregation, analysis, and storage have ongoing operating costs and fees that require specific skill sets and expertise to maximize their utility. Direct service organizations are best positioned often to collect and share data. However, restrictive philanthropic and government funding criteria often make it difficult for organizations to secure sustained funding that will allow them to set up these systems and technical infrastructure, cover ongoing operational costs, or hire individuals with the expertise to maintain them. Furthermore, increased collaboration is needed across the ecosystem. Human trafficking data comes from victims' lived traumatic experiences. It's not typically captured and collected through large institutions, but through organizations that have established relationships and trust with victims and survivors of human trafficking. To advance data capture and collection, larger institutions need to identify groups on the ground and invest in supporting and developing relationships with these organizations. Data scientists and technologists can help aggregate and analyze data once collected. Much of the data collected on human trafficking is messy. It's unstructured, unorganized, biased, observational, and private. And expertise is required to develop high standards of evidence from data. Fourth, as um, my fellow panelists, uh, Ms. Harris was mentioning, we need to conduct due diligence. Despite best intentions, data research technology solutions uh, collected or created for socially beneficial uses may still be misinterpreted, mismanaged, misused, or abused in ways that result in human rights harms. Due diligence must be conducted on research, data collection, and use in technologies pursued by government, law enforcement, companies, and service providers to identify, avoid, prevent, and mitigate all potential adverse human rights impacts in accordance with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And finally, fifth, we need to invest in flexible solutions and support systems that can adapt and evolve in tandem with the ever-shifting nature of human trafficking, the needs of organizations on the ground, and societal trends. Structures and systems for collecting data are often not reflective of the ways in which direct service providers on the ground collect data. We need agile tools that can be used and deployed in a range of contexts or by practitioners with varying levels of expertise that can incorporate new and emerging ways in which human trafficking take shape in the future. Through the Accelerator Program, Tech Against Trafficking is partnered on new tools such as new privacy preserving mechanisms, the Human Trafficking Case Data Standard, and others that we hope embody these five considerations. And I'd be happy to go into greater detail on those tools today. Thank you very much. At this point, we will begin our first round of questions and the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Let me pose this question for all to comment on, all of our witnesses. The Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or the TVPA, guides the federal response to human trafficking in the United States and defines it as a labor or commercial sex act induced by force, fraud, or coercion. Many NGOs and others have contributed greatly to the protection of survivors and uh, prosecution of the traffickers, but more needs to be done, especially uh, with the addition of, of cyber-enabled traffic. Can each of you briefly describe the risk to society at large if we all fail to better understand the phenomenon of human trafficking and develop better tools to prevent or disrupt it? Chairwoman, um, I, I will speak briefly to that and I'll reference the work that GAO has done um, looking at online sex trafficking. And some of the concerns that we note are the concerns that are being noted here as well. You know, um, it's difficult to go after these bad actors online. Um, some of the work that GAO has been doing is looking specifically at law enforcement's ability 
to do, you know, to um, ability and preparedness to go after these bad actors online. Um, another issue that we brought up in our online sex trafficking work was the fact that, you know, you might have a platform in one location and then the trafficking happening somewhere else. So it can be really challenging um, to address these issues. And I'll yield my time because I know the other panelists have things they want to say. Yes, Ms. Shelley. I think that what we've seen in the last two years is a tremendous growth in human trafficking and also many survivors without the support systems have returned to human trafficking. One of the things that we've noted in our research as with this online movement, we have much more involvement of, for example, hotels near highways because you can have all of this going on in a very impersonal world in which it is hard to detect where the exploitation is going on and it is very hard to find the victims of trafficking. So we have many different problems that we need to, that we see coming as a result of this enormous growth of online trade. And I will point out that the largest network that was ever found in the United States and prosecuted, which had 350,000 websites associated with it, was run out of China and operated in over 50 different cities in the United States. Ms. Darnton. Thank you so much. I'd say that trafficking manifests in a variety of different ways, and we need the data and information applicable to those various scenarios to help us understand how it takes shape and respond appropriately with interventions that are actually impactful. Over the course of the past two years, we've seen COVID-19 drive many individuals online, just as one example. And we needed the data to better understand where exploitation, abuse, and eventual trafficking were connected to those online points, how we could actually see the breakdown of trafficking occurring across this new ecosystem and these new societal trends. And with that, without that information, it would have been very difficult to actually be able to address it to take the actions necessary to raise awareness, to create prevention mechanisms that were effective and to have actors across the system respond. So in short, to answer your question, I think that without the data, we risk creating mismatches, mismatch approaches or responses that don't actually address the issue at hand. Ms. Harris. In addition to what my uh, fellow panelists have said, I, your question about the risk, um, the, the research that is available uh, suggests that there are connections between human trafficking and other forms of traffic, trafficking, other forms of organized crime. And so uh, all of that needs to be understood with the data and uh, the approaches need to be informed by the best scientific evidence on those issues. Ms. Harris, can you elaborate on why AAAS uh, and those you work with in the scientific community prioritize human rights work, such as human trafficking? Sure. Uh, years ago, decades ago, the American Association for the Advancement of Science recognized that human rights was central to our mission of uh, advancing science and serving society, and that there are so many connections between science and human rights, both uh, the applications of science to solving human rights concerns, but also human rights as a value that is central to science and a responsibility of scientists. And so uh, we have had a human rights program for decades now, uh, and the On-Call Scientist Project in particular is a way that we have um, made it possible for many in the scientific community to get involved, not just work that's happening at AAAS. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter a letter into the record from Polaris, which operates the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Objection. I now ask Mr. Lucas to take his five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Norton, 
Tech Against Trafficking has done great work to advance technology to help combat human trafficking. And as we've learned through witness testimony today, there are instances where technology has enabled bad actors, but also instances where technology has advanced efforts to identify and stop criminals. Could you discuss how the committee can further support innovative technologies to combat human trafficking? And while you're thinking about that, my second question will be, are there certain research activities you recommend Congress support to encourage the adoption and utilization of those technologies and the techniques? Thank you so much. Um, yes, I think there's a number of ways in which the committee can help to support innovative technologies. I think many of the ways that that can occur are actually supporting, as I mentioned in my initial statements, the ecosystem in which the technology will be used. We found that many of the partnerships, the collaborations across the sector are historically underfunded. And so even when we have wonderful solutions that are promoting new advancements in research and science best practice or state-of-the-art technologies, they aren't supported in a way that makes them fully effective and impactful. I think Telfinder is a wonderful example of this. Launched in 2014, Telfinder really did use uh, new advancements in technology, best practices, um, researchers and technologists across the field to create new systems, new operating models, and new tools for the field. But unfortunately, it shut down towards the end of 2021 because it lacked funding. And so being able to not just test these new innovative solutions through accelerator programs like Tech Against Trafficking, but also others, but then to support both the funding, the collaboration, and the use of those technologies over time. There's a, often a cliff, and once that cliff of support drops off, those technologies are unable to be effectively deployed and utilized across the space. So I'd say that's one main way in which the committee could support, but it's also being able to socialize what technologies are already in existence. We initially did a mapping of technology tools used across the, tech, the trafficking space back in, I think it was 2018. And we found over 300 technology tools that were already in existence, many of which do the exact same thing. There were approximately 70 tools that identified victims of trafficking or traffickers themselves. And individual organizations looking to deploy, deploy these technologies weren't aware that these tools existed. So they were just recreating the same type of tool again and again. And this is just inefficient in terms of funding and sharing best practices and what could be deployed or lifted and shifted to be used in new context. So being able to create a mechanism that can share best practices and learnings across this field to actually advance the use of innovative technologies to new actors that can help adapt them to their own context would also be helpful. In terms of your second question and research activities that you should support, I think all of my co-panelists um, on this on, in this discussion today are running wonderful activities that could be supported. But I think that we also need to consider the landscape of research that's out to there today and how it actually translates to on the ground initiatives and interventions. Research has really helped us understand the prevalence rates as well as the work that's currently going on in the field, how this crime is manifesting, but we need to make sure that research is also going towards dedicating time and energy to understanding how the overarching understanding of how the field is actually manifesting is being conducted on how things are working on the ground. So what's effective, what's impactful, and how will it actually be taken up and used by actors closest to the problem? Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. In October, 2021, GAO reported data on missing and murdered indigenous women is unknown because federal databases do not contain comprehensive national data. I'm deeply concerned about this as indigenous populations in Oklahoma are affected by these crimes, including human trafficking. What steps can be taken to improve data collection analysis analysis to better understand and identify these trends and crimes. Thank you, Congressman. So in the report, we also mentioned the existence of two laws that, that had recently passed, um, Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act. And those in those laws, there are requirements for the Attorney General 
to report to Congress on the numbers of missing and, or murdered Indigenous women. And if that information isn't readily available, then the Attorney General is required to offer up suggestions or recommendations on how to better gain information on those numbers. So we think that those are two main ways that can help inform and enhance the information that we get about this crisis. But of course, the report noted, because there, there's not a lot of data, it's just really challenging to, to, to get a handle on how, how deep um, the crisis is. But we think that Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act are in, um, important and helpful ways to get there. With that, Madam Chairman, I think my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you very much. The clerk will take over from here. Ms. Bonamici is recognized. Thank you so much. And thank you to, to Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. And thank you, especially to our witnesses. I appreciate the work that you're doing, along with so many others who are shining a light on this you know, often hidden and often overlooked reality of human trafficking and exploitation. You know, each witness identified in similar but sometimes different ways the challenges around the standardization of collected data or the lack of reliable systems in place to facilitate data sharing. And those challenges hinder the anti-trafficking efforts, including the effort to measure the prevalence of human trafficking and also implement prevention or demand reduction strategies. Even within the interagency task force to monitor and combat trafficking, for example, many of the agencies that collect human trafficking data and carry out some research often have a mission focused uh, uh, approach and that can result in siloed data and research rather than a coordinated approach to understanding um, how to combat human trafficking. So I wanna start by asking, well, first I wanna thank uh, Ranking Member Lucas for bringing up the missing and murdered indigenous um, uh, uh, issue and was a strong supporter of Savannah's act. Uh, and look forward to seeing it implemented in, in a strong way. Uh, but I wanna ask um, first Dr. Shelley, what are the challenges and possible solutions to supporting more information sharing through secure yet interoperable systems? And how can the federal government work internally, but also with external partners to better coordinate victim identification and data uh, collection standards? I think that there are <clears throat> many sources of information. So, for example, as I mentioned in my statement, we have T visas in which individuals um, who agree to cooperate with law enforcement issue detailed statements on, on their exploitation. We have never anonymized this data so that we could understand how much of this trafficking is affecting different communities in our society. That's just one example of where to start. It was also mentioned that the SARS reporting uh, to the FinCEN has increased, but we have not done enough analysis of what is behind this data and how we could use that in combination with other insights and with the business community that is being very aggressive in trying to mine their data to find this. So why I think we not, if I don't mean to interrupt, but why, have, why has that not been done? Is it, is it simply a funding issue? In part, it's a, a, a funding issue. And in part, it's an absence of funding basic research on this subject. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dar uh, Ms. Uh, Darnton, sa same question um, from your perspective. Uh, what, what are the possible solutions to supporting more, more information sharing through secure yet interoperable systems? And, and how can the federal government work internally and with external partners um, to better coordinate victim identification and data collection standards? One of the ways is that we actually need to build trust between the entities sharing their data and the larger ecosystem. So in 2019, we actually worked on a new privacy preserving mechanism with the counter trafficking data collaborative out of the International Organization on Migration that allowed us to generate synthetic data sets which represent statistical properties of sensitive data sets, rather than actually potentially identifiable individuals and pre-compute them in a way that doesn't reveal small or precise data counts, thereby creating a data interface which allows for users to explore the structure of data without actually revealing personal or identifiable information. And that's just kind of one 
way in which we can innovatively think about privacy preserving mechanisms that protect the individual information and allow for wider data sharing without the same concerns of the ramifications of data sharing. So I think building up, exploring those types of new innovative solutions is one way in which we can promote the data sharing. And the so other- I, I don't mean okay. to cut you off, but I really want to get a question from Ms. Harris. Of course, sorry. <laughs> Brief period of time off. Ms. Harris, your in your testimony, you shared a very interesting example of researchers developing a labor-safe digital certificate to combat forced labor among foreign fishing vessels. And considering the unique labor conditions of the fishing industry that you highlighted, are there lessons or best practices arising from that work than a, that can apply to other sectors? I think the, the main lesson from that work is how difficult it is to pull the, the different types of uh, data together in order to develop something like that. And how many collaborators are needed from the private sector, from NGOs, people who are on the ground who understand the dynamics of what's happening and the people who are collecting the data and also some of the sources that aren't usually thought of um, for, for that information, such as the internal information that companies are collecting simply in the, pro in the process of business, of doing business. Great, thank you so much. And I see my time has expired. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Mr. Posey is recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Darden, uh, the hearing charter mentions a 2019 report by the Department of Transportation Advisory Committee on Human Trafficking. It states that data collection, analysis, and information sharing are critical to inform the transportation industry regarding the nature and the severity of human trafficking. There's a lot of good work being done to combat human trafficking by the federal government, the private sector, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, yet there seems to be some obstacles in making sure these entities are effectively working together uh, regarding the nature and severity of human trafficking. How is the federal government currently working uh, with the private sector to address those obstacles? I think the government is working with individual private actors quite frequently, but those are um, often not necessarily at a global level or at a systematic level. And so I believe that we could do this more systematically to create collaborative approaches where entire industries are coming together with government to think through the way that trafficking is manifesting and data is being shared and collected across the space. Um, so I that my key recommendation there would be that government could come into the rooms and be at the table with larger co industry collaborations rather than one-off relationships with different companies. That is a first step, but I think we could do it more systematically. Thank you. Do, do any of the witnesses have further thoughts on that? Yes, I do. Um, research done by the financial community and data mining has shown that um, rideshare services are key expediters of human trafficking. And yet there's not been enough pressure put on the rideshare services to partner with the research community. The data could be anonymized to understand the patterns of human trafficking and how these rideshare services facilitate it. So it's not just, we've had great efforts by the airplane sector, but not by this sector. And also by the trucking sector, we've had progress, but not rideshare. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any other witnesses have comments? All right, we'll, we'll go back to uh, Ms. Dart again. Uh, what suggestions uh, do you have to improve the cooperation? I think that if we promoted a universal human trafficking case data standard, that that would be extremely helpful in being able to create a similar language structure and standard that allowed for data sharing across the board. Um, as many of you know, the way that organizations, companies, and other actors within the system collect data is different. The terminology they use is different. The larger kind of holistic story of a victim or survivor is different, and it makes it difficult to actually share across systems. So by utilizing universally 
applicable case data standards that can be used at all levels and all types of actors would really help facilitate information exchange and large scale data aggregation. Uh, do you see any government programs or mandates uh, that might be hindering these groups, uh, especially the trucking industry, uh, from their efforts to combat human trafficking? I think some of the other panelists may have responses to that one specific to trucking. Panelists? All right. Uh, that's all I've got here, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Ms. Stevens is recognized. Great. Um, th thank you so much uh, to our chair and our witnesses for today's hearing. I think it's very evident from what we've heard from our witnesses and from our chairwoman and our ranking member that what is taking place with human trafficking is oftentimes not just a couple of isolated incidences or one-off individual actors, but this is a part of a systemic, more holistic uh, in, engagement that uh, involves a multitude of industries and big, broader stakeholders, which is why we're having a conversation today and why we're having today's hearing about uh, data and, uh, and in particular, the, the research and development tools that could combat uh, human trafficking. And last year in Michigan, um, the Michigan Human Trafficking uh, Commission focused on analyzing federally funded data sets collected from southeastern Michigan. This is, you know, a border destination. Uh, we're the only place in the country that goes south of, of Canada, uh, right there in, in southeastern Michigan and Wayne County. And um, their, their data collection had provided services to victims and survivors of human trafficking. And the Michigan Commission's review of the data proved, frankly, just to be challenging. Um, the commission concluded that there is a pressing need to create a standardized data reporting framework specifically for victim service providers with categories for victim typology and services provided. So sort of pinpointed it. Dr. Goodwin, Dr. Shelley, and Ms. Harris, since a lack of standardization uh, of the data has been shown to hinder progress in anti-human trafficking efforts, could you share um, any efforts from federal research agencies to develop data standards to combat the existence of human trafficking at a national and global level? And to preface that in terms of standards, you know, we are the, the committee that works really closely and oversees the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So we, we spend a lot of time talking about standards. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about some of the work that we've done um, looking at human trafficking in Indian country and some of the recommendations we made to ensure that the data were collected or were collected period, right? So when we did that work, um, it, we, we found that it was, had been really difficult to actually put a number or any kind of number on the number of um, human trafficking victims who were um, indigenous women because they weren't, at the time, the Department of Justice wasn't even collecting data on race. Um, and so it would have been really difficult to, to, tell, to tell anything about that number when you're not even collecting data on race or ethnicity. We made a recommendation in our report and DOJ has since done that. And then moving forward, as we talk about the, the crisis of missing or murdered indigenous women, we know that they are also collecting and providing data on race, gender, and age to get at, to, to provide a broader picture for what's happening. But it's been really challenging to get at one number uh, for a, a number of reasons that I'll, you know, that I'll talk about briefly. One of them, um, when you're talking about law enforcement, just kind of having law enforcement understand like what human trafficking is when, you know, when they're looking at it. Um, that's another thing that we found when we were doing the work, like law enforcement officers had not, they have been at this point, but they had not received the, the type of training that they would need to identify human trafficking when they, you know, um, were uh, showed up to a, a particular scene. So that's one of the ways. But um, I think that the Department of Justice has been, you know, making efforts to address this and to provide um, additional data. And then if, if you go back to Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act, you know, if 
um, the data, the comprehensive data aren't out there, then, you know, the attorney general and some of the other agencies have to explain why and then come up with recommendations to ensure that that information is, is readily available. Yeah, and I know Ms. Darton just chimed in on the, the chat, and I appreciate that because in her written testimony, she shared the Tech Against Trafficking, Human Trafficking's case data standards to encourage consistency across the, the field. And so I, I, obviously I kind of, this is a question for everybody, but Ms. Darton, if you wanna get, get, get in, that'd be great. Yes, happy to share more on that. Um, I think that the we have created this human trafficking case data standard in partnership with organizations on the ground to create a common language and ability to be able to share data back and forth between different organizations. But to your point, uh, Representative Stevens, I think that these are often difficult to integrate on the ground. And so the purpose of this specific toolkit was to meet service providers where they're at with the capabilities that they currently have and enable them to integrate it into their existing systems without too much overhead cost. And so I think that is an area that we can continue to explore to not just create new standards and systems that will allow for data collection and sharing, but to ensure that it actually works um, based on their current capabilities and expertise. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'm out of time, but we'll stay on. There's a lot of brilliant people on the science committee who are gonna be continuing to ask questions and so, Thank you to Ms. Harris and Ms. Uh, Dr. Jolly and Ms. Harris as well. well. We'll we'll yield back the time. Mr. Babin is recognized. You're on mute, Mr. Babin. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Johnson and uh, Ranking Member Lucas, for holding this imparted hearing, and thank you to our witnesses uh, for being here with us today. I believe this issue is one of dire importance and something that demands immediate action. I'd be very remiss if I didn't mention one surefire way uh, that we can curb the evil practice of human trafficking, and, and that is by securing our southern border. Um, in the U.S., immigrants, especially immigrant women, make up the largest portion of human trafficking victims. In 2016, the Department of State estimated that 57,700 victims were trafficked into the United States annually. However, as we've discussed today, we have insufficient data collection. And so that we know the true number is much larger and in, 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 in fact, impossible to determine. And it's not just trafficked immigrant women, sophisticated transnational organizations are notorious for using children to get single adult males, not just across the border, but through border pro uh, patrol processing. Studies done by the Latin American branch of the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women estimate that at least, at least 60% of Latin American children who set out to cross the border alone or with smugglers have been caught by the cartels and are being abused in child pornography or drug trafficking. However, we know uh, that that percentage is far greater today, given our current state of crisis along the southern border. Uh, the forms of exploitation, sex trafficking, forced labor, and domestic servitude that constitute human trafficking are antithetical to everything, uh, all of our principles of human dignity that Americans hold dear. And while previous federal government ventures have been relatively unsuccessful, I'm very hopeful that we can work together to provide the right tools, personnel, and partnerships to defeat this growing menace. But that being said, my question is for any of the witnesses uh, was this, do you believe that securing our Southern border would disrupt these evil uh, human trafficking networks and prevent the abuse, the rape, the smuggling of migrants in the United States? Any of you witnesses? So Congressman, um, GAO hasn't done work looking specifically at that issue, but um, what I can do, I can take it back to my agency to see if we have anything that might be useful to you and I'll circle back to your staffers. Thank, thank you so much. And question number two, in what ways can modeling and accurate data collection be utilized by the federal agencies to better restrict human trafficking on our borders? To answer your first 
Um, question, Representative Babin. I do believe that closing our borders in such a way would force the issue further underground and make it more difficult to identify. It would also be violative of a range of other human rights, so that would be need to be considered and would only prevent our ability to help individuals experiencing exploitation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? As was, as was mentioned earlier, we have a convergence of many different forms of transnational crime. And unfortunately, we have very sophisticated transnational crime that figures through tunnels, through others of operating successfully. What we need to be doing is finding an overall strategy um, of how to address these problems, but the problems of, of human trafficking are not just problems of transnational crime, of which I've written much, but there are many more facilitators in our society that we need to be working on. And some of that of exploitation of labor victims is that we need to go after some of the people who are exploiting this labor so that we are not providing a, you know, opportunities for people to be exploited. Absolutely, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, I, I uh, uh, Madam Chair, I, I think that's uh, uh, the end of my line of questioning. I just wanna say thank you and I will just yield back. Thank you, witnesses. Mr. McNerney is recognized. Well, I thank the chair and I thank the witnesses. Uh, it's an important topic and difficult one. Uh, Ms. Darnton, uh, you discussed how machine learning can protect the privacy of human trafficking victims while maintaining data structure. How can AI and machine learning enhance the privacy of human trafficking data sets? So I think there's a range of highly technical methodologies that we can deploy in order to be able to protect the privacy within data sets. So the one that I mentioned earlier was creating synthetic data sets that represent statistical properties of a sensitive data set rather than the actually potential identifiable information on individuals. So that's one way that we can do it, but there's a range of other new and emerging technologies that we could explore in order to make sure that this is being considered within large scale data sets. My one kind of additional comment there with the be as we work to continuing developing, testing, utilizing these new models that we also have to make sure that we are taking appropriate action to also avoid, prevent, and mitigate the other human rights harms that can come along with new and emerging technologies. Well, and hopefully AI can be uh, helpful in, in, in developing that. Uh, Tech Against Trafficking participated in Code 8.7 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals the eradication of human trafficking by bringing together an international group of research institutions using computational science and AI to understand and find solutions to the trafficking problem. What are some of the high level recommendations from the Code 8.7 workshop? I'd have to go back and look at my notes on that. The workshop was quite productive and brought many actors throughout the sector together. And I think that was one of its real strengths is there is not often times where you can get service providers, researchers, practitioners, and companies at the same table discussing the issues at length. And that was a major win for the field and happy to share out further information on the um, more detailed recommendations to follow. Well, that's great. Could, could you make that available to the committee then? Yes, happy to. Thank you. Uh, and how can the US government and its research entities assist in adopting uh, AI as a solution to human trafficking? I think that there's a lot we can do with the data that we already have. For example, there are now more than 2000 federal cases of human trafficking that have been prosecuted. Um, and yet we have not used AI to go through these cases and try to extract patterns, um, financing patterns, geospatial relationships, recruitment. There's a huge amount of data that we have not used. And that's because the files are extensive, but AI could help us enormously. And we've used some of this AI in the reviews that we've done to try and get at certain elements of this problem. But the data is sitting there. And with AI, much advances could be made in analyzing where we are. 
Good. And so you brought up, um, Dr. Shell, you brought up uh, algor developing algorithms. That's kind of what you're referring to right now? Exactly. The financial community has developed algorithms, and you can also um, develop other patterns that you want to see of the locations of where it's occurring, the recruitment patterns, the ages of people. There's, there's much data that can be obtained. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, um, to your knowledge, has the U.S. government taken any steps to adopt AI technology to address human trafficking? And if so, what was the outcome? Um, not to my knowledge, um, Congressman, but I can certainly um, check our notes and circle back to you. Um, I do think that this is a promising uh, practice or something that um, should be uh, more closely examined. And then the, the issue about the data, you know, a gentle reminder that, you know, there, there are a lot of data out there, but some of the data are sensitive. Some of the data, as I mentioned earlier, are for specific purposes in those databases. And so a challenge that we will all face is trying to find ways to enhance that data sharing or just basically to get at some of that data, particularly the data that's more sensitive. Right. And that was the, the point of my first question. How do we protect people's uh, privacy, especially the victims of this crime? Uh, is there sufficient expertise in the U.S. government workforce to deploy and manage AI technology aimed at human trafficking? Uh, Dr. Goodwin? That's not something that GAO has looked in um, um, on, a, on a broader, deeper scale. So I think the other panelists are probably better suited to respond to that one. Well, I don't have enough time for another question, but <laughs> okay. I just want to leave you with this. Um, uh, how can AI be used to help track digital currency use in human trafficking? But I've run out of time, um, and I'm going to yield back. Mr. Waltz is recognized. Hey, uh, thank you so much. And I, I actually am interested in that question uh, to, to follow up with my colleague. How can um, AI be used to, for on the digital currency side that's, that's being used for human trafficking? So I'll touch on it uh, briefly from the work that we've done um, on uh, virtual currencies use. We didn't specifically look at how AI could be helpful, but one of the things we do talk about like when you're using those virtual currency kiosks or those Bitcoin kiosks, like um, one of the challenges that law enforcement has had is kind of identifying and, and where they are so that when transactions are occurring, you know, maybe they could um, find a way to, to, um, to get to those places where those illicit activities might be happening. And so I could see where AI might be useful in terms of just identifying the people who might be at the kiosk or just, you know, doing some kind of geospatial um, testing or geospatial location to actually see where those kiosks might be. That, that's being done also by the financial community. That's one of the things they're plugging into their algorithms at the present. Right. No, that's you, great. And I know right. there, there's a number of software solutions you know, on, the, on the market now that can go through the ledgers uh, and really kind of track that metadata and, and, and pull some, some meaningful conclusions. Um, uh, Dr. Goodwin and, and Ms. Darden, um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot, I think, already today about the lack of appropriate data, um, and that's a, it's a problem that I faced in trying to legislate. I've introduced uh, uh, H.R. 4070, the Stop Human Trafficking Act of 2021, and the bill will direct the Attorney General uh, to conduct a study in coordination with the President's Interagency Task Force uh, to monitor and combat human trafficking in persons, uh, to look at the, the prevalence and instances of human trafficking at adult entertainment clubs uh, and establishments across the United States. And specifically, the study will examine uh, how victims are trafficked, the demographics of the victims, uh, if the victim was an employee of the adult uh, entertainment establishment, and the methods of fraud, uh, force coercion used by traffickers at these venues and specifically uh, is what we're looking at to then look at potential uh, legislation locally in Florida. Uh, a number of measures have been introduced to actually raise the age uh, to 21. Uh, that's uh, that, that that where it's acceptable to have uh, young girls at these at these establishments. So, you know, how how can federal agencies and NGOs coordinate on? And, and I know you've talked to it a bit, but if you could emphasize you know, specifically for these adult information venues um, on, on gathering data from cases specific 
to a certain trafficking hub location in a way that allows them to apply these methods and findings to other trafficking hubs. I'm happy to respond first. I think one of the ways which we could further collaborate would be to actually utilize the information and in existing research by groups such as Polaris. Polaris has mapped the typologies of trafficking. Um, my information might be slightly out of date, but last I heard they had identified 26 different typologies of trafficking and been able to narrow down in exactly how it was happening in places like massage parlors or nail salons and being able to really paint a picture of the exact activities, the data that would need to be captured to better understand how trafficking was manifesting in those scenarios, and then provide that intel to law enforcement and others to be able to take um, direct approaches to address it. And so I think working with groups on the ground that have done that research already would be a first step. And then the second would be ensuring that we're working with um, victims, survivors that have been in these different settings and scenarios to help us better understand what to be looking for, how to do it in rights respecting ways and make sure that we're taking appropriate action to address it. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, I know we've interacted with Polaris quite a bit, but we'll reach out and, and, and look at specifically that typology um, uh, and specifically how it applies to adult entertainment venues. And Dr. Shelley, in the 40 seconds I have remaining, um, you, you noted that many victims of trafficking do not have access to the telephone number of the hotline. I'm in the final stages. Uh, we're drafting a bill that will require the Department of Labor and the Department of Homeland Security's blue campaign to create a human trafficking awareness and resources poster um, that includes a hotline number. And it would be required in employers of all types of businesses that have higher cases of human trafficking. Do you think that will be helpful? and beneficial in victim reporting? I think it may be helpful, but I think that so many victims of human trafficking are held in closed facilities. One of the things where you should be focusing a lot on is on hospitals and medical facilities where often victims of human trafficking come and there's not sufficient training for personnel and not enough outreach being done. And that's a key place that we need to be thinking about. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I've run out of time, but that, that I think that's very helpful, Dr. Shelley, and we'll take, a, we'll take a hard look at that as we finalize the legislation. And I yield my time. Dr. Foster is recognized. Thank you. I'm audible here? Yes, you are, sir. Okay. Well, now, a recurring theme in all of your testimony here has been the rise of anonymous or pseudonymous cryptocurrencies for human trafficking. You know, as it is being used for money laundering, ransomware, and a whole raft of criminal activities. And so in response to this, many countries have simply banned cryptocurrencies um, or crypto assets generally, uh, which I believe is neither necessary nor advisable. And, and I believe that what we need instead is to move away from the system we have of, of purely anonymous or pseudonymous crypto assets uh, with maybe occasional blacklisting of the wallets of bad actors as they may be identified. Uh, to a system of controlled anonymity, where crypto transactions are only possible and legal between whitelisted and legally traceable participants, who can nonetheless typically remain pseudonymous. And so what this would mean in practice is that under most circumstances, crypto assets could be used anonymously like cash, and government will not have access to all the transaction information uh, for surveillance purposes, as, for example, it has in China. But when you have evidence that a crime has been committed, you can go before a judge in a court system you trust, convince the judge that a crime has in fact been committed, and the court can then order the de-anonymization of the participants, uh, and if necessary, to extradite them. And if the court is convinced that a participant is in fact a bad actor, it can order all transactions of that participant de-anonymized, you know, very much like you can do with a gangster's bank accounts. Now, while this won't provide the kind of blanket surveillance of, of crypto transactions that might be most effective in preventing human trafficking, wouldn't this sort of court-controlled anonymity uh, be a significant step forward? Um, let's see, yeah, Ms. Darton, you wanna grab onto that or, or anyone else that has comments on, on how, we, you know, how we deal with the, the tension between uh, surveillance and um, and you know criminal activities in crypto. I'd like to say that one of the things that you're talking about is something that is very 
heavy and demanding in time. And, um, and one of the concerns that we have with human trafficking is the rapidity with which this phenomenon goes on. And so often the kind of procedure that you're talking about takes hours and hours of law enforcement time. And often when you're dealing with the expansion of cryptocurrency, some of it which is going on in the dark web today, you're dealing with a problem that is, take, is very time intensive. And therefore we're looking at problems that cannot be easily resolved. Um, and, and so therefore I think you need to be thinking about the kind of resource allocations it takes to do the kind of analysis of the cryptocurrency that you're talking about right now. Yeah. And, and so what I was trying to describe there was you know, a system whereby um, when you're thinking of buying a crypto asset, you can inspect it or have your software inspect it, make sure that all of the, everyone who's ever owned that is a whitelisted participant and a, a legal, someone who's legally traceable so that you actually will, um, you know, will not be able to, well, you could purchase uh, a crypto asset that has been handed between questionable individuals, but unless everyone on that who has handled it has been, you know, is on the white list, uh, then, then the crypto asset would essentially be trash and would not be legal to bring into the, you know, converted to cash or brought into the, the lit financial system. I have less experience and expertise in this area, but I would recommend speaking to the FAST initiative, Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking, as I believe they've explored this in some, at some level. Okay, um, and I think, I think the, key, the key element here is producing a list of authorized participants to be whitelisted. Um, and you know, I think, I believe that is really an essential um, government job. You, you have to provide a, a, provide a secure digital ID um, and fortunately, the National Institute of Standards and, and Technology has produced really useful standards for you know, what are called digital driver's licenses or mobile IDs uh, that allow anyone to use their modern smartphone uh, to prove they are who they say they are and associate it with a real ID compliant driver's license. Uh, and this will really, I believe, provide the necessary legal traceability online. And states like Oklahoma, Arizona, Louisiana, and others are adopting these NIST standards uh, with great success. And I think that uh, requiring that for participation in the in crypto transaction would be a huge step forward. Um, anyway, I believe my time is up here, and um, and any further thoughts you have on that would be would be appreciated for the record. Thank you all. I'd love to respond to that if there is is time, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> Oh, wait, was, uh, is that 30 seconds okay? Yes. Thank you. So I just think that one quick comment there would be that that, does, that could potentially bring up discrimination and bias issues into who was permitted to be on that list of individuals. And so something to consider would be how do we ensure that there are not inherent discriminatory practice built into who could access and how could the user pervasive use of phones, for example, as a key um, portable ID, actually disenfranchise other communities and populations. So for example, nowadays, we, many individuals don't have access to smartphones. We're also seeing families share a single phone. So how would that impact certain communities and vulnerable populations would be something you'd want to consider. That's right. And, and the bipartisan infrastructure bill is a huge step forward ensuring that everyone in this country, and no matter what their means, will have access to a basic internet connection and a mobile device. So and thank you, uh, Ms. Um, I thank the chair for the, um, the time here and yield back. Mr. Baird is recognized. Yes, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas for holding this hearing. And, you know, I especially appreciate the expert witnesses uh, for their sharing their um, expertise with this committee uh, so that we can make uh, informed decisions. My question really to begin with uh, really goes back to what Representative Waltz and Representative Foster are referring to. And Dr. Goodwin, you mentioned in your GA report uh, that cryptocurrency is often used as the preferred currency in the dark web to finance human trafficking 
transactions. And like many technologies, evolution in cryptocurrencies have taken steps forward as a positive innovation. But unfortunately, criminals have exploited cryptocurrencies for their own uses as well. So Dr. Goodwin, I'm gonna start with you. Are there any other areas uh, that the government should be looking at to better understand and counter these types of crimes uh, with the continuing evolution of currency technologies in the financial system? So thank you for that question. Um, yes, and so as you mentioned, we referenced in our report the the fact that you know some of these transactions are happening on the dark web. I will say, um, Congressman, that GAO actually issued two reports on this topic. One is a law enforcement sensitive report, and I cannot go into that um, report in this setting. But my staff and I will happily um, circle back to you to have a more in depth conversation there. Um, another. Um, issue that we brought up in, in the report, when we talk about the use of cryptocurrency or virtual currencies, particularly as um, on the online sex marketplace, what we were finding with that work was maybe the virtual currency was used to pay for ads, and those ads themselves were would direct you to where you could engage in kind of the, the, the sex trafficking. So that's another concern that we raised in the report. Like while you might be able to track the currency up until the point where you're purchasing the ad, then once that ad is purchased, that ad might direct you to more illicit activity. So those are some concerns that we have raised. And continuing on with that, do you, th do you think there's a place for public-private partnerships uh, to play a role in this in this endeavor? Uh, we do, and so. Um, as we've talked about earlier, just the need for like maybe law enforcement working with um, advocacy groups or nonprofits, um, maybe government um, um, getting information from some of these from some of these organizations who are, as we talked about, on the ground, kind of more engaged in efforts to combat these types of activities. I think there absolutely is a role here. Thank I mean, you. Can Go ahead. I add something? In an yeah. in another NSF grant that I have now, we have a partnership with one of the major um, private organizations that is working on following uh, the use of cyber currencies online and has worked on the issue of human trafficking or cryptocurrencies. So there is a possibility and a willingness of private sector actors to work with researchers. Well, thank you for that answer. Dr. Shelley, was any, any of the other um... Witnesses care to make a comment in that in that area? Uh, private and private public uh, collaboration is going to be absolutely essential for this, and not just in the way that um, that was mentioned. It, from the government's perspective, it's it's acquiring information, but also the specific research questions. There's so much information out there that it's it's actually identifying what information is most useful to answering what questions are going to be most immediately helpful to the uh, to preventing trafficking and helping survivors. And so it's also about uh, creating equitable collaborations between the service providers that they are getting as much out of the collaboration as the researchers and, uh, and government officials are getting out of it. That kind of collaboration is what's needed to make breakthroughs in this area. Thank you. And I see I only have about 20 seconds left. And so uh, Dr. Shelley, any quick, any quick comments uh, in the 20 seconds uh, about uh, what we might have to address the data gaps we have? I, th I think that we need to be working together across agencies and working with the cyber, with the online community and with the business community that has large amounts of data. And there is possibilities of data sharing. And I don't think we've talked enough about the insights that are coming from the business community. Thank you very much. And I see my time is up and I yield back, Madam Chair. Ms. Moore is recognized. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and, and really, I want to appreciate 
uh, not only our, our brilliant uh, witnesses that have been here today, but I'm gonna thank the chairwoman and, and the ranking member for pulling this uh, together. Uh, I uh, have been really interested in this particular topic, uh, which the hearing charter uh, uh, identifies uh, the data challenges impacting uh, human trafficking. And I do have a bill that I'm introducing along with uh, Representative Beyer, uh, which uh, uh, would, uh, uh, would, would really, I believe, address many of the issues that we've talked about here uh, today. Uh, I was really inspired uh, to push forward in this work by someone that you may know, Dr. Brooke Bellow out of Florida, who was trafficked as a tween uh, and got her PhD. And as a matter of fact, owns one of these uh, platforms. She was the uh, advocate of the year, a victim at in 2019, DOJ, Google Next Generation uh, policy maker. Um, and so this bill uh, would be the Counter Human Trafficking Research and Development Act. And this hearing is right on point uh, for gathering the information that we need. I'm gonna ask a really scary question. We've had really great information here today. One really frightening question that I have given your testimony, I guess I'll start with Dr. Grisham and, uh, and Dr. Shelley. Are, are the bad guys ahead of us on cyber, uh, 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 on using uh, social media platforms, uh, Bitcoin? Are they ahead of us? If we're looking at pulling a, a bill together, what is our timeline? And really, what, what is the financial gap that we're facing in terms of getting all of this stuff coordinated? Uh, I noticed, for example, Dr. Shelley, um, you talked about how big the network is. I mean, it's not just that it's a strip club, it's every hotel, it's ride shares, uh, and so on. So that would be one question. And the second question I would have for Ms. Harris and Ms. Um, uh, Darton, I think we've beaten this horse almost to death regarding um, security, but I, could you give me some examples, for example, of what Facebook could do or Uber or one of the ride shares could do specifically, or we could require them to do specifically to close some of these um, gaps and to help us uh, uh, with it. And so I would uh, I would yield for those for those answers in that order. Uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Goodwin, Doctor Shelley, uh, Miss um, Darton, and Miss Harris. Brooks, I'm sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, so um, so I'll start the, the latter part because I, I, I don't quite remember the first part of the question. So, um, so the work that we're doing, uh, that we're currently doing, looking at kind of online sex trafficking or like the online exploitation, um, we, we know that some of the um, media companies are engaging in this space, trying to find ways to ensure that that's not happening, you know, in their marketplaces or on, on their sites, but because you know the technology is so prevalent and it's it's advancing um, you know quite rapidly, um, it has been very difficult for law enforcement to keep pace. So when you asked about whether the bad actors were winning, I don't know that I would say they were winning or losing. I would say that because the technology is rapidly expanding and rapidly being used, it has been challenging for law enforcement to keep pace. Uh, that, that Shelley. I, I think we've seen an enormous growth of human trafficking, including the size of the networks, because of their ability to work online together. As I mentioned, we have research already five years ago that $250 million were spent on 60 million ads online, and the networks for these are just enormous. Wow. And yes, we've used AI, but we're dealing with problems. And you asked about like Uber. One of the things that was found a few years ago by the financial community is that they had a warning that if someone spent uh, money on 13 Uber rides a day, that was highly correlated with human trafficking. But I'm not aware of that kind of data being anonymized to look at these patterns. 
And this is an enormous insight into understanding the geospatial operations, the modus operandi of human traffickers. How do you allocate resources if you don't know where the problem is and how it's operating within your community? All right, I think I've run out of time. I think I better slow down my ride sharing because I, I do it a lot. I yield back. Representative Moore, I will, if I could just say this, um, one of the things we also looked at and we've been paying attention to is where the opportunities are to better train, particularly law enforcement personnel to go after these bad actors um, and to, to engage in you know, different hiring practices to ensure that the law enforcement folks you have on site actually understand the technology and can kind of get in there and, and find ways to, to address it in a different, in a different fashion. And, and the use of AI is uh, really promising here. Thank you so very much. So much to ask a little time. Ms. Bice is recognized. Thank you so much. I appreciate the witnesses for being here this afternoon. Um, let me ask you, with the pop-up nature of dark web marketplaces, what are some of the challenges in tracking data from these anonymous sources? And that, do you know of any software or technology that's out there that's helping us navigate that environment? And this is for any of the witnesses. Yes, I do. For example, there was a major study done by um, DARPA that, that I alluded to. And there were some tools that came out of this. And in our research at the research center, I had we've used some of these research tools in the dark web to monitor and try and find um, behavior. So that has already been funded by the government and used successfully. And in a project that we're doing now funded by NSF, we're looking at some other forms of illicit trade that are going on using um, tools on the dark web and they're revealing, they're, they're, they're proving quite successful. Great, thank you for that. Um, in addition, oh, sorry, just to respond to that as well, uh, Representative Vice, I'd say that uh, we put out a paper with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, I think it was last year, entitled Leveraging Innovation to Fight Trafficking in Human Beings, a Comprehensive Analysis of Tech Tools. And it has a list of technology tools that are being utilized across the anti-trafficking space, which includes some of the tools that you referenced. So happy to go deeper there as needed. Perfect. Thank you for thank you for following up with that. Um, and I, I want to follow it up with this. Um, what are some of the existing efforts and opportunities for improved data sharing among um, NGOs, state, local, um, law enforcement? What are we doing to sort of bring all of that data together to analyze that? Is there one sort of repository for this, the, all of that data, or are we sort of fragmented? Everything is fragmented, unfortunately. But I'd say that the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative does have one of the largest data sets on human trafficking cases, and it's not enough. We're still not pulling in data sets from a lot of the service providers, the companies that could be sharing data on the ways in which trafficking is taking place, but it is a relatively good start. And in August 2021, the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative Microsoft actually released the largest public data set that can be used to fight human trafficking, representing data from over 150,000 victims and survivors of trafficking across 189 countries and territories. So I, I think that's a good starting place and we can use that as a, a springboard, hopefully to further data collection in the future. Excellent. And one thing that, if, that I will add is that what we know from the virtual currencies work that we did, you know, certain law enforcement agencies are partnering with um, data analytics groups and other groups to gain a little more, to gain more information about how to spot uh, these types of illicit activity and to become more knowledgeable on the topic. So there are partnerships that are occurring with law enforcement and some of the business or analytic groups. Excellent. It sounds like we need to be maybe more thoughtful. Um, from a holistic perspective, though, in bringing all of these groups together, because we would be able to sort of glean more insight into being able to, to prevent uh, human trafficking if we had all of this data collected um, in one repository. So thank you, um, Madam Chair. I yield back. Ms. Ross is recognized. Um, 
Thank you very much. And thank you for holding this hearing, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. And thanks to all the witnesses for being with us today. Um, I'm from the state of North Carolina. And in 2020, we had 260 reported human trafficking cases, but we know that that number um, is much higher. And there even have been human trafficking cases in the suburbs in um, my district. Um, and uh, this is a very, very serious problem. And as you've, um, you've said, we have kind of a hodgepodge approach and we need to consolidate and get much more granular, both with the data and with the solution. Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about how we can partner with research institutions and nonprofits. So the Research Triangle Institute in North Carolina recently got a grant from the National Institute for Justice to, to work on this issue, find data. And then we also in my district uh, or in North Carolina have a, a, a nonprofit called Project No Rest which is dedicated to increasing the awareness uh, and prevention of human trafficking, particularly in young people. Um, and so I wanted to ask first Dr. Shelley, but then anybody else, how can research institutions benefit from nonprofit expertise at, to develop targeted uh, technological solutions and share that information in combating human trafficking? I think it's important that we need to have a whole of society approach. So we need non-governmental organizations, we need the business community, we need government, and we need all of these collaborating. And one of the things that we need to do is to be able to, to verify the data. Um, the question was asked about these databases, but sometimes this data is unverified and sometimes it's incompatible and can't just be combined. Um, a few years ago, I was at a, a, um, a remarkable conference in North Carolina that was talking about how much of human trafficking was going on along Route 95. Yes. And I think we need to be taking much more focus on the transport sector and not just looking at what is going on. I mean, it is your problem in North Carolina and you're representing your constituency, but also how we are, you are part of a hub and a network, and there are not federal cases that have been prosecuted in North Carolina, even though there has certainly been very serious investigations involving um, hotels there, as I learned when I was um, at this conference. Yeah, and truck stops, um, and truck as stops. we've talked about. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, um, my, my next question is for you. Um, we understand that um, there are a lot of vulnerable populations, particularly in the immigrant community. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, people's worry about um, immigration enforcement keeps them from providing information to both law enforcement and re researchers. How can we overcome um, some of the hesitancy, which is legitimate because people care about their immigration status, to be able to collect the data that we need to collect to solve this problem and then uh, protect people who may have even been brought here um, against their will um, in violation of our immigration laws. So I'll answer that um, and reference some of the previous work that we've done on trafficking. I haven't done the work looking specifically at the border, but I think that this applies, right, in terms of victims coming forward. Um, so one of the things we found is, you know, having um, service providers available, having um, NGOs, who other people who aren't law enforcement, right, having those um, individuals available to talk to people who we suspect have been trafficked. Um, that goes a long way. You need to build the trust. You need to make certain that it's a comfortable, safe, and secure environment so that they feel comfortable coming forward. Um, coming here to a new country, there are a lot of other um, concerns that they will have, um, but I think having victim service providers available, um, and I think that um, Professor Shelley has talked earlier about like the T visas, um, so there are ways to kind of ensure that 
people who are coming who are who are coming across the border into this country if they're being trafficked i think that there are ways to ensure that they are protected and that the information is is gotten and that you know um the the folks who are trafficking them are are caught thank you very much and madam chair i yield back Ms. kim is recognized Thank you. Thank you, Chair and uh, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. And I also want to thank all of our witnesses for taking the time to join us. I think um, your efforts and research make it very clear there is a need to improve data collection and research on human trafficking. And it is my hope that we can act during this Congress from what we learn uh, from our conversations today. Uh, my first question is to you, Dr. Shelley. You make note in your written testimony that existing research has not yielded data for analysis that allows us to examine comprehensively the rapid evolution of human trafficking over the past decade, as traffickers ex have exploited online technology and social media. You know, social media is used by everyone now more than ever. And traffickers not only use social media to recruit victims, but to control them. Question is, is there any reliable data on human traffickers use of social media and what can be done to improve the reliability of this data? There is some data, some research that's been done on, in fact, that I'm signing in my class on the role of technology in this area. But this is one area in which there needs to be much more funded research and analysis, and this is where AI um, in collaboration with social media, but could help um, find much more on human trafficking. Also, you can mine Twitter and many other forms of social media, and there's good research methods that have been developed. So this is an area which is underfunded and which should be encouraged. Got it. Um, thank you for that answer. Uh, funding, as always, is uh, the biggest area where uh, we need more help on, I guess. Um, Dr. Shelley, continuing uh, with the questioning to you, you make note that more research into illicit supply chains is needed to understand the true extent of human trafficking operations, and prior to your research that there has been little research to illicit supply chains. So how has your research on illicit supply chains informed the efforts to combat human trafficking and what areas and sectors of the illicit supply chain need more research and data to help guide the law enforcement's efforts to crack down on human trafficking? I think you can summarize it in the following ways. We need to be looking at the locales and the facilitators as the last uh, Congresswoman asked about of truck stops. And we haven't done enough research on how this is a key part of supply chains. We need to be working, as I said, with, with Uber and car share services. We need to be working with data of the financial community. When I finished this research that I've been doing, I've been doing webinars for the financial community, trying to get the research out to people who are informing the hospitality industry on what they can be doing ideas on how to expand T visas to include protections for vulnerable individuals to be reporting. All of these are part of it. And we also need to be increasing our intersection with and data collection at the point of treatment in medical centers. And as one of my students was saying to me last night that during the pandemic, this effort has certainly diminished as healthcare workers have been so focused on saving lives that they haven't been looking at the human traffic thing that they often see in front of their eyes. So we, these are all key points on supply chains that we need to be mapping that we're not sufficiently paying attention to and of which there's almost no research. Um, I know in the chat room that you had written to all of us, uh, you written the, um, the, the need to expand the TV as to include people who are reporting on what they have seen on human trafficking, um, otherwise they're afraid to come forward. I would love to see uh, some more of your uh, writing there too. So if you can share that with the rest of us, that would be great. I couldn't be more honored. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have one last question to Ms. Harris. Um, can you please ex uh, elaborate on the role the modeling can play in assisting in understanding 
where, when, and what, and how traffic, uh, human trafficking can be prevented. Um, and then any other uh, panelists, if you wanna jump in after Ms. Harry speaks. Thank you for the question. Uh, modeling is one way where the, the whole ecosystem that we've been talking about, understanding the mechanics of how uh, trafficking happens, how people are vulnerable, what vulnerabilities are, um, are being preyed on, what, how the, the system is able to sustain itself through time, what are those points of interventions as have been mentioned in different uh, points in the testimony here. And network science, modeling, projections, there are a lot of tools from different areas of, of scientific research that could help us better understand that and th thus be able to figure out ways to intervene. And so um, my recommendations are to think beyond the kinds of research that are simply documenting what is happening, but also thinking ahead to problem solving and thinking about the systemic issues that are involved um, involved in human trafficking. That that's that's the kind of research that is needed to to really support the work of um, of everybody in the different sectors who are at trying to combat human trafficking. Thank you. Looks like my time has run up. Um, if anyone wants to provide uh, extra responses and if you may be able to contact my office with that, that would be great. Thank you so much. Mr. Byers recognized. China. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, sure. Pro Professor Shelley, uh, I was friends with Nancy and Omer Hurst, so I'm so thrilled that you have their chair at George Mason. Um, I am thank you for all your research. Um, so, so to, Hannah Darden, um, a, a few years ago, we had a very good hearing in SST on this subject. And one of the things that came up was the whole idea of um, what they were calling digital trafficking signatures, and that there needed to be a repository within law enforcement for these, that so much could be used if we could figure out the digital trafficking signatures. Can you comment on that or explain more what we should be doing? Apologies, Mr. Bayer. I believe that might've been one of the other panelists that went deep on that. Um, so happy to connect with, I believe it was MIT or Polaris on their, their thinking on that and send over more. Okay, okay, that'd be great, because it was fascinating to try to get ahead of the curve on that. And, and then back for, for uh, Ms. Goodwin or Dr. Goodwin, you know, there are a number of bills in before Congress right now in cryptocurrency, uh, probably the most comprehensive one we introduced to establish who was going to regulate which were the securities, which were the commodities you know, between the SEC and the CFTC, because it's widely recognized that there's an extraordinary amount of fraud um, and terrorism and rogue governments. But you put your finger very clearly on the role that it plays in human trafficking. Um, is there the sense that with SEC and CFTC regulation that it can make enough of a difference um, to help regulate or, or minimize the human trafficking that's going on right now? So Congressman, there might be some opportunities there. Um, and um, I don't have the information in front of me now to fully respond to that question, but I will um, circle back to you and your staff on that. Great. And, and we will get you a copy of the legislation also. Oh, thank you. That um, would be really very much in play right now with the mm -hmm. heads of the respective agencies. Okay. And, and um, Professor Shelley, you know, I, we're so excited that the Competes Act passed and the UCKS passed in the, in the Senate with big bipartisan majorities. Um, you know, you mentioned how the National Science Foundation research has made a real difference. How do we make sure that with this unprecedented increase in basic research that the appropriate amount or enough amount is going to human trafficking? I think that's part of the role of Congress to make sure that it reaches its intended target. I mean, this area that we've been working on, I don't want to say, but we've done amazing work over three years for about a quarter of a million dollars. It's not that much. So much 
you know, a, a order of magnitude greater than this could help enormously in doing the kind of data analytics and work that's needed. But you need the kind of interdisciplinary teams that the NSF brings together of I'm a social scientist of data analytics people, supply chain people, people with experience in the dark web and AI, which is something which a research found, um, organization like the NSF can do. And it also has lots of experience in working with the business community. So it should have, I think, significant resources that would allow the kind of sensitive, thoughtful research Ours is having some of the most direct impact, but others as people are doing also thoughtful research in other areas as well. Yeah, and, and Professor Shelley, I, I know one of the things that my friends at the National Science Foundation will tell me too is that the grants are made on the basis of the grant requests that are made. So um, I encourage you and, and the people working in your sphere in academia to just get as many requests in as possible. Um, so that they can be funded. Uh, and, and thanks for doing that. And I just want to, just a quick shout out to all four of you for being brave enough to take on one of the ugliest sides of human nature. I, it's almost hard for me to imagine getting up every morning to, to work on an issue where people are being so brutalized and their lives so destroyed. So uh, thank you very much for doing that. And, and thank you for the difference that you make. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Mr. Feenster is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas. And thank you to all our witnesses for your testimony and sharing your extent, extensive experience and knowledge in this important subject. Human trafficking, as we know, is a crime that is hidden in plain sight in our neighborhoods, our airports, and online. Because of the difficulty of detection to fighting tra trafficking, a multi-pronged effect is needed. With collaboration from all involved in Iowa, local law enforcement and state department of public safety collaborate to find leads and root out despicable human trafficking predators. They utilize recently developed software to gather points of data uh, on the internet and find traf trafficking victims and help streamline investigations to focus on rescuing victims and stopping traffickers. The state also works with private industry to increase recognition and prevention on the road and at lodging locations that traffickers may utilize. Ms. Uh, Darton and Dr. Shelley, the Iowa Office to Combat Human Trafficking compiled a free online human trafficking prevention training and certification program for hotel and lodging owners and staff to complete in order to receive local and state public funding. Additionally, Iowa DOT motor vehicle enforcement officers have partnered with truckers against trafficking to, pro to provide vulnerable information to professional drivers so they can assist in recognition and reporting. These are private citizens that can help be the eyes and ears on the road and lo in lodging locations that traffickers traverse. How can widespread awareness like this increase and improve data collection on human trafficking? I just want to say that several, maybe five years ago or more, I was in Iowa helping to set up and work with some of your attorney general's office and others working on this issue, and they brought in wonderful NGOs. So what you've done in Iowa is so thoughtful and should be copied by many other states. So you, you, you've put a lot of thought into this process before you started it, and I think that's absolutely key. And, and I think your involvement of, of the transport sector because you're such key hubs and involvement with the private sector is the kind of example that needs to be replicated. I'd say one thing that could also help build out our current understanding and the data on human trafficking would be ensuring that the individuals identifying cases of trafficking or potential behavior that would indicate human trafficking, share it with repositories such as the National Human Trafficking Hotline, Polaris, and others. Oftentimes, the information collected is 
partial in nature, and we need a more comprehensive understanding of the situation or scenario in, in order to really build up our overarching understanding of how this crime is manifesting. And so ensuring that the stories are getting to centralized repositories, experts on human trafficking that can help unpack this data can really help advance our understanding and the overarching system. Yeah, I agree. And I, I really appreciate your comments. I, I fully agree with what you're saying. Ms. Darton, um, you've recommended consideration of privacy and implementing tech-based solutions. The nature of human trafficking crimes means that survivors' privacy and confidentiality is the utmost importance, even if that means case data has to be withheld of for their personal safety. Could you offer suggestions on how the committee should be thinking about protecting privacy and confidentiality as we consider R&D investments in this technology? Yeah, so my written testimony includes a few examples here. I think our exploration of new privacy preserving mechanisms through the accelerator program is one of the, the ways that we'd really suggest um, future explorations uh, take shape. But I think also one of the things we often talk about in the human rights field is considering how we're counterbalancing different rights. There's individual safety and there's privacy, and those are both human rights. And we need to make sure that by looking to protect individual safety, we are not compromising privacy on the other hand. So taking a balanced approach that considers preventing avoiding mitigating human rights abuses of all kinds is really necessary. I think that Europe's been putting out some great recommendations and regulations on this, on mandatory human rights due diligence, on privacy and security of data. And we can work with our partners overseas to look at best practices and trends in actually tackling the issue to uh, ensure that we're considering a base of exploration of things that's already been done, tested and tried. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Darden, for those comments. I greatly appreciate it. And my time has run out, and I yield back. Mr. Kasten is recognized. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate uh, all our witnesses being here. Um, the, I'm uh, hopping back and forth here with financial services, and uh, interestingly enough, we're talking about crypto over there, um, which all seems to be tied into this. Dr. Goodwin, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you have some estimates, you know, when all our financial institutions are required to file the SARS, if this activity reports, if we have reason to believe that there's something that needs to come to the attention of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Do you have any sense from your, your data, how often are digital virtual currencies used in human trafficking? So Congressman, what we do know from the work that we've done is that you know from the time period from 2017 to 2020, the um, the number of um, SARS reports that were filed with FinCEN those doubled over that period. I can get you the actual numbers. I don't have them in front of me right now, but I can certainly get you the actual numbers. But we did see an increase from with financial institutions filing SARS reports with FinCEN. Um, oh, okay, so I think you've sort of intimated at my follow up question, <laughs> which you trust the data. Right, because the there's there's an increase in the filings, but if somebody is you know if if I'm using dollars, there's all sorts of know your customer and anti money laundering rules that are going to be triggered. So, and I realize that you this is an unanswerable question, but I'll mm -hmm. defer to your wisdom. Do you have reason to believe that that there is more or less slipping through the system with the rise of of digital currencies? You know, based on the work that we've done. Um, we know that the numbers are probably not um, complete. Um, and so I would suspect that those numbers are much higher. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we also know that, you know, crypto virtual currencies are the second highest form of payment um, from the report that we looked at for Polaris for this online, for um, um, the trafficking. And so I would, I would say that it's probably much higher than the numbers that we know right now. And this is another reason why it's so important that we get more information and have more data so that we can get at the actual numbers. Okay, so, so now if you take the, recognize that we're getting at ever smaller pieces of the actual sort of piece of the crime. Mm -hmm. um, if you flag through FinCEN that you know, the SARS gets filed, you tie this, this is a, this is a digital currency. Um, and, and so now it's, it's been flagged. We know that's happened. FinCEN has it on reporting. Do you have the authority without violating all sorts of civil liberties laws to actually go in and look at the blockchain on that digital currency to, 
to know what's happened because in, in theory, you know, and we've heard some of the crypto advocates say this, well, it's great because all the transactions are recorded. But of course, in order to do that, you've got to decrypt it and you've got to get into all sorts of civil, li civil liberties issues. So when you find these, do you find that the presence of the blockchain on something like a Bitcoin gives you better ability to track or are you precluded from actually looking at the blockchain and seeing the history of transactions? You know, Congressman, I remember this conversation when we were doing this work, but I'm not remembering the response. So what I will do is I will circle back to your staff to provide the response, because this is something that we um, asked about and looked into, but I'm not remembering um, a thorough response right now. Okay, well, it, 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 and, and, you know, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you, this is as much a technical issue as a civil Absolutely. issue. And, you know, as we sit there and say, how are we going to regulate this, this space? I have this ongoing conversation with with Chairman Gensler with the SEC that the two problems with the Wild West is that in the first instance there's no there's no sheriff and in the second instance when the sheriff shows up lots of people want to shoot him. <laughs> so we're trying to make sure. Um, you know, oh sorry. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. one one last thing I will say, you know, when we when we talk about, you know, the suspicious activity reports for human trafficking, um when we looked at just the act, the, the SARS related to virtual currency in general, not just for human trafficking, but when financial institutions file SARS, we saw that quadruple over that time period, 2017 to 2020. And I will circle back to you about the specifics on that as well. Okay. Um, there's only 30 seconds left, but do okay. any other witnesses have any other, any thoughts on this general question of how to, how we make sure that the appropriate technical and regulatory tools are in place for these emerging digital currencies? I think we need to also as was mentioned earlier, work with the, the platforms that are posting this because that's the compounding factor. You put advertisements on the website and it draws customers. And many of these advertisements are being paid for with cryptocurrencies and, you know, and the uh, platforms are not requiring enough identification of the people who are posting these ads. So that's a very important entry point into the whole process and builds on what uh, Dr. Goodwin was saying earlier. Yeah, that's absolutely true, uh, Professor Shelley. And you know, in in the virtual currencies report, we talk about that. You know, the fact that the the currency is used to purchase ads, the ads themselves are kind of what is facilitating the trafficking. And so you might be able to see the ads being purchased, but what happens once the ads are out there? And though that's where the trafficking. Is being that's one of the ways the trafficking is being facilitated through the use of the virtual currency. Thank you. I appreciate the chair letting us go a little bit over. Uh, I yield back my absence of time. Mr. Jimenez is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Chair. Um, question: I, go, I want to go back to basics. Uh, the the folks that are being trafficked, where are they coming from? In in labor trafficking, we believe that a lot of them are, are foreigners, but we don't know absolutely because there's no data. But there's many cases in this country where human smuggling turns into human trafficking. On human trafficking for sex, the majority of the victims are American citizens. We're the only advanced democratic society in which our citizens and often disproportionately minorities, Black, Hispanic, Native American are victims of human trafficking. The exact data we don't have, but if you put the research together, that's what it's showing. And we have so little research on labor trafficking that we do not know, you know the countries of origin. There is some American citizens who are being labor trafficked, but it's a small part of the problem as far as I know. The, on the labor traffic side, um... Would you say, because you have apparently have very little data, would you say that the majority of those are, don't have a legal status here in the United States, or do they have legal status in the United States? They sometimes have a legal status in the, that they come under an H-2A visa to work in the United States, so they have a legal right to be working, but then um, there are problems in the way the employers treat them under these visas, and they may be labor trafficked. Are they? Do you think that there is a sizable number that are not that don't have a, a legal standing here in the United States? I think that exists too, but we really don't know the extent of it, and I think that's one area in which we really need more research. 
We, that's why I'm saying that a lot of the T visas that are issued are for people who are victims of labor trafficking, but we've done no analysis to understand how they arrive and, and the circumstances of whether they came under some legal status through recruiters and then were exploited. There's so much more that can be found in the data analytics if we could, in the data if we could analyze it. Okay, the, in, in that regard, is there something that, is there something that we can do um, with our Customs and Border Protection people to try to filter those that they believe or could be, could be there for, to be trafficked for, in other words? I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting information, and we have information that, that sometimes some of the folks that are being pushed, let's say through the southern border, um, they have to pay the cartels X number of thousands of dollars in order to get through. And that in order to pay back the cartels that they become in essence slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, are you hearing that too? It's not just hearing it. I mean, there is research that's been done in Mexico. I have one colleague who's a specialist on this. And this is where my colleagues who've been testifying have noted the convergence between different forms of, of criminality. And that's why I'm saying that human smuggling, often when the cartels come and extract money from the people in transit, they wind up into a traffic situation. And that's one of the things that we really need to be doing research on. I noticed that in my statement. Fair enough. Also, I think that we need to do also research on uh, how we can combat. It appears that there is some kind of a network where you can actually, as a business owner, actually contract with the cartels to push somebody into the country, claim that individual as some kind of relative or something, and then end up having that individual work in your company. Have you heard that also? I've heard of every kind of variation. We've had uh, some investigations of what's gone on with networks facilitating trafficking of Guatemalan youth to egg farms in Ohio, for example. There, there is data in, the, in these cases that one can see. Um, we don't need to be relying so much on rumor. We could be relying much more on what we're finding through investigations that have been held in understanding the processes, but that's not been done. And how, how would you go about doing that? Just the way we've been going through some of the state investigation, federal investigations, state investigations, there's a lot of data that just has not been used and subject to data analytics. That's what I've been doing under my NSF research, is trying okay. to understand. Would it be helpful then to, to create something, some kind of a joint, uh, a national database where all the data is then put together and analyzed so that we can find out how we can, how we can stop this problem from, begin, from, from, starting, from starting, I mean, from, from getting here and being utilized. Do you think that would be helpful, a nation, national kind of database? I don't think there, this data cannot easily be combined. So that what you have of an NGO reporting to Polaris has not been verified by law enforcement as opposed to what a federal investigator finds out. But you could have separate databases that you could begin to look at um, patterns across them. And that could be done. Fair enough, I, I see that my time is up. Thank you so much uh, for your answers and I yield back. Ms. Stansberry is recognized. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair, for convening today's panel. As the Congresswoman from New Mexico's first congressional district, the crisis of human trafficking and particularly of missing and murdered indigenous relatives and women is one of my top priorities. And I wanna say that this crisis is felt so deeply in our communities and across our state. Each case number represents a life and a story and a tear in the fabric of our communities. And I wanna take a moment this morning as we're discussing these difficult issues to honor those lives and to honor those families who are survivors. As a state with one of the highest incidents of MMIWNR, the issue is a crisis that is affecting all of our communities. And as we know, this is a crisis not only in New Mexico's indigenous communities, but across the US and across the world, in fact. 
In my previous role as a state legislator, I was proud to work alongside uh, state representatives on Brea Romero, Derek Lente, Wanda Johnson, and our State Indian Affairs Office and Secretary Lynn Trujillo to pass legislation to create a task force to address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives. And this last year, that task force published its findings. And one of the most important recommendations that came out of that work was about data and cross-jurisdictional sharing of data. In fact, one of the biggest challenges for our tribal, state, and federal law enforcement is that cross-jurisdictional coordination and tracking, because as Indigenous people go missing, especially in non-Indigenous communities, it's rare that our law enforcement notifies and shares that data with other authorities so that there can be appropriate follow-up. So as many of the witnesses have stated today, accurate reporting, coordination between agencies, and of course, seeking justice justice is crucial to addressing this crisis and finding and bringing to justice individuals involved in this challenge. Ensuring that our communities also have the resources to help those who are in crisis, to support the survivors and their families, and to bring individuals to justice is also crucial. So for those of you that don't know, I am fortunate enough to serve in this role as Congresswoman after Secretary Deb Holland. And as many of you know, she helped to shine a national light on this issue and champion the Not Invisible Act while she was serving in this congressional seat and has continued that work as Secretary of the Interior and is helping to lead that work in, in the federal government today. So I'm, have, I'm extremely honored to have the opportunity to continue that work here in Congress in partnership with our tribal communities and federal and local authorities. And I'm especially proud that our president, President Biden, as well as the governor of New Mexico have elevated this issue of missing and murdered indigenous women by executive order. And here in Congress, it is absolutely crucial. And I know there's been some discussion uh, today about this. We have to pass the Violence Against Women Act. And so I urge my colleagues in the Senate to pass that bill Urgently, we need the statutory language and the tools and the resources that are in that bill to address this crisis. So I want to just take a moment here to ask Dr. Shelley and others here. The National Academies uh, recently in 2020 met to discuss human trafficking and the mobility of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And one expert stated that in 2016, there were over 5,000 cases and reports of missing uh, American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls to the FBI. But the Department of Justice's missing persons database only logged 116 cases. So clearly there's a mismatch and even across our federal agencies and how data is being reported. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the data tools and research that's needed to track these cases, but most importantly, how do we use that information to help survivors and people who are living in crisis to get help and support before these tragedies occur? I mean, if we don't understand who are the victims, who is suffering, then we can't target the assistance programs. And so, so little of this, this, this mismatch that you've described of 100 to 5,000 is important and we're not getting the information from healthcare workers and we're not getting information from morgues as we need to of suspicions of human trafficking. And that's been a, a huge hole for years. Then we need to be able to do a geospatial analysis to understand where this is and where resources more need to be deployed. Last year, I was speaking to the nursing community of deans of nursing schools on how to implement this in curriculum. So because young girls and women don't just die, usually there is violence and calls to medical authorities before this ultimately happens, we need these communities to be much more integrated into the data collection and in the um, service delivery activity. Thank you, doctor. I know we're out of time for my particular uh, questions today, but I just wanna thank all of you for the work that you do. And I very much look forward to working with this committee and my colleagues to get the Violence Against Women Act passed in the Senate 
and also to addressing this crisis and ensuring that we're providing the resources and tools to address this in our community. So thank you very much. And with that, I yield. Congresswoman, um, this is um, GAO. So given the work that we've done on MMIW issues, we, we will circle back to your staff to discuss some of the databases because we talk about you know four main databases that DOJ has, although none of them are set up or designed to to identify uh, victims of trafficking. So I'll circle back to your to your staff on that. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Stansbury. Uh, our chair has migrated off to another committee hearing, so I'm authorized to bring the hearing to a close. So let me first just thank all the witnesses for testifying before the committee today. It's been a long two and a half hours on a difficult subject with many good ideas. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. And with that, the witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned.